Welcome to Big Valley Grace Community Church. Good morning. morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. It's good to be seen and to see one another. When we come together in person, it's an opportunity to interact with one another. So let's make sure before we leave this place, if you haven't had opportunity to interact with someone else in the body of Christ, as part of church family, make sure you take time to do so. It should be different that you came in person than if you were to watch online, right? So when you're here, make sure that you're interacting with one another, you're talking with one another, you're meeting people, and it's a great opportunity to encourage one another, and I'm glad that you're here. This week, this weekend, brings a close to a week of a specific focus of prayer for us as a church family, and that is praying for the unborn. We have had multiple opportunities to do that on our own. Wednesday night, there were about a hundred on campus in the venue who prayed for the unborn that evening. Yesterday morning, I'm not sure how many people were at the park, but there were a lot of people at the park praying for the unborn, essentially doing a prayer walk around about a square mile of our town over on Coffee Road. And one of the things that yesterday morning really gripped me regarding praying for the unborn is this. Our Love Life missionary for Modesto shared that on Coffee Road at that facility, there are about eight to 10 surgical abortions that take place every Thursday and about 20 chemical abortions throughout the week. And our missionary challenged us as we, walk, as we walked by Coleman F. Brown School on the way to go pray against what's happening at the abortion clinic to think this. That's a kindergarten classroom or more than a kindergarten classroom every week. And that is a very sobering thought to me, to think that that's happening in our town on Coffee Road. And so I wanna pray again right now. Father God, Lord, there is a battle, there is a war that's happening in our own town. And it's a war against the unborn and the unborn have no defense. But you can protect them. And you can save them. And I pray that as we have prayed on our own, in community, at the church, in town, and we've had this focused week of prayer for the unborn, I pray that you would answer the prayers and that lives would be saved because this church has prayed for the unborn this week. And Lord, as our focus of prayer for the week comes to a close, may our prayers for the unborn not cease, but that we would continue to encourage one another to pray that lives would be changed, lives would be saved, that moms and dads would come to their senses, they'd be woken up spiritually, to recognize that is a baby. It's a life, it's a human life. And may we be a church that encourages, may we be a church that is a safe place for those who have been impacted by abortion, that this might be a place that healing can be found, forgiveness in Christ can be found. And would we also be a church that is vocal to stand up for what is true, what is right, and to continue to pray against what is happening in abortion clinics and for the saving of lives. And so God, help us to be bold, help us to be full of truth and full of grace. That's what our Bible says about Jesus, that he was full of grace and truth. So help us to be like Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said. Amen. Amen, amen. Today we are gonna continue in our series, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one today. There are Bibles available in this room right over here, the altar room. You can also receive prayer. If you need prayer, come to the altar room after the gathering. We want to make sure everyone has a Bible. But before we get into Matthew chapter 6, I'd like to spend some time addressing not just the war that's happening on Coffee Road, but the war that we see happening in our world right now regarding the nation of Israel. And it is not my purpose to be a newscaster in this moment. 
If you would like news, go find the news. I can't possibly watch every video that has come out this week regarding what's happening in Israel or read every article. I'm not a news reporter, I'm a pastor. What I intend to do in this moment is to ask some questions and encourage us to look in our Bibles. It might be done when, it might be that when I get done doing what I'm about to do, you actually have more questions than you had before I started, and that's okay. Our encouragement when we see things like a war happening in the nation of Israel, which is very significant, and we will see that clearly in our Bibles, is to encourage one another. We need to be in the Word, and we need to be continuing to look at our Bibles, because God has written a story, and we know how it ends. And so let's encourage one another right here. So I will begin in this way. What is the significance of the regathering of the nation of Israel? The, the nation of Israel was formed by God, scattered, brought back, scattered again, brought back again. It's very significant. Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time With his hand, the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. God has been regathering his chosen nation, the nation of Israel. There's over seven million Jews in the nation of Israel as of March of this year. You can also look at some other passages regarding the regathering of Israel. Ezekiel 20, 41 through 42. Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14. Hosea 3, 4 through 5. Zechariah 10, 8 through 10. And the context surrounding all of those verses. But a question we should probably ask is, why does the focus of conflict always in our world keep coming back around Jerusalem? Why do we continue to see conflict in our world about Jerusalem? Zechariah 12, 2, 3, and 9 says, Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. And in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. I'm very thankful that the United States of America is an ally of Israel. If there comes a day when the United States of America is no longer an ally of Israel, this will not be a safe country to live in because of the wrath of God against the enemies of Israel. We need to understand the the role of Israel in God's economy, his program what he's doing, and we need to be prayerful. We're going to in just a moment. Will the recurring conflict in Israel ever end? Man, there's just trouble in that part of the globe like always. Is it ever going to end? Well, when Jesus was speaking about things to come, when he's foretelling the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, in Luke 21, 24, he says this, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which we will talk about a little bit more in another section of scripture as we go here. But God is working out his plan. God has a plan in history that he is working out. Some of the things that we see now will be more clearly understood as God unfolds his plan. So we may have questions when we read things, but there is going to come a time when the scene will shift. We are looking for the coming of Jesus. We're looking for the coming of Jesus. We're looking for the second coming of Jesus. We're looking for a kingdom. We're looking for our redemption. What nations are involved in end times conflict? Great question to ask. I'm going to read here from Ezekiel 38. There's going to be a bunch of names here you're not going to recognize. What nations are involved in the end times conflict? Son of man, set your face towards Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws. I will bring you out 
And all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, put with them, and all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Tagarma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. There's a number of perspectives of who are these countries, who are these nations that are listed in this text. One perspective is that Magog refers to Russia, the prince of Rosh, Rosh being a root of Russia. We see Persia listed in verse 5, Persia being what we would know in modern day as Iran. Interesting regarding the relationship of those two countries and their conflict, the relationship with the conflict that we're seeing right now, is what we see right now in the present war um, leading to what we see in this passage? I don't know. I, I think as time goes on, the, the Lord will make clear um, what he's foretelling us as history progresses, but we should pay attention to any nation that comes against Israel. That should catch our attention, and we should be prayerful. We're going to be in just a moment. How should we understand the current war in Israel? So there's a war happening. We live in Modesto or surrounding area. How does this matter for us? How should we understand this war? Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12, it says, Why are the nations in an uproar? So why are the nations in conflict? Why are they fighting? And the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. When we see conflict happening in the nations, what is our response? Honor Jesus. Humble ourselves before Jesus. Give honor to God. Respect God. Understand he is God over all sovereign, over all nations. And when we see conflict, especially around the nation of Israel, what should we do? We should be prayerful. We're going to in just a moment. It says, worship the Lord. Take refuge in him. When we see this disturbance in our world, it should cause us to come towards Jesus and to find safety in Jesus, not in anything else, not in our nation, but safety in Jesus, take refuge in him. And as things get crazy, which they already are, and as they get crazier, which they are, what is our response? Run to Jesus and encourage others to, and take refuge in him. Being in Christ is the safest place to be. In Luke chapter 21, 28, it says, but when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So when the signs of the times, when the end times happen, when things are unfolding in history, what is our response? Turn around, run, hide? No, it says straighten up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. We are to be looking for Jesus. That's what we should be expecting to happen. Things are getting crazy. Okay, that is one crazier moment towards Jesus coming. And we're looking for Jesus. And our encouragement is to look for Jesus. If our focus is only horizontal on what is happening around us and the destruction that's happening, our focus is gonna be in the wrong place. We need to be looking for Jesus and encouraging others, let's look for Jesus. It doesn't mean we ignore. You can't ignore a war. 
But it does mean where is our heart and our mind and our focus and where are we being drawn to? It's to Jesus. So how does this relate to our current focus on prayer? We've been in this series, Lord Teach Us to Pray. Here we've got this major event happening in our world. What should that be doing in us? Well, the Bible is helpful to teach us what to do in this moment. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That is built as a city that is compact together to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, in ordinance for Israel. To give thanks to the name of the Lord, for their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This passage is pretty instructive. What should our, what should our perspective be is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Romans eleven twenty five 25 through 27. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So there is a war happening. Israel is involved as a follower of Jesus. What is some basic instruction that I can have? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the salvation of Israel, which I want to do right now. Father God, Lord, in the same way that there are innocent lives being destroyed on Coffee Road in our town every week, there are innocent lives being destroyed in Israel right now. And it's incredible devastation. There's great wickedness that's happening. Great wickedness that's happening. God, I pray portions of Psalm 83. Oh God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. Oh God, do not be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. And those who hate you have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people and conspire together against your treasured ones. They have said, come and let us wipe them out as a nation that the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they have conspired together with one mind. Against you they make a covenant. Oh God, make them like the whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, like fire that burns the forest and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest. Terrify them with your storm. Fill their faces with dishonor that they may seek your name. O oh Lord, let them be ashamed and dismayed forever. And let them be humiliated and perish that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Lord, we pray your word and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the salvation of Israel. Lord, we understand that you have a plan that you're working out in the totality of human history. And as, as you choose to reveal to us what it is you're doing in the bigger scene of redemption, Lord, help us to have understanding from your word and to be led by your Holy Spirit that we might honor you through all of these things that are happening in our world. May you be honored. May you be glorified. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen. amen. Matthew chapter six. We're in a series on prayer. Last week, I recapped where we've gone so far, and I'm not going to do that again this week, but I am gonna encourage you to go and to, if you need a refresher on where we are, you have questions on where we've been so far in this text. We've spent quite a few weeks now teaching through it, and I would just encourage you to use the resource that is available, which is the videos online that are, that are free to watch on our website. But I am gonna read Matthew six, one through 15.
Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father who's in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Again, I'm not going to recap, but there are resources available if you want to get caught up. But what I am going to do is I'm going to start by asking this question. Why are there brackets around a portion of Matthew 6, 13? Why are there brackets? In your Bible, it may be that the fullness of 6, 13 that I read has no brackets and the full verse is in there. It may be that what I read in Matthew 6, 13, part of it's not in brackets and part of it is in brackets. And it may be that what I read in Matthew 6, 13, when you read along in your Bible, you thought, I think there's a portion missing in my Bible. What's going on? It might be that there is a note either in the verse itself or a footnote below that explains something about a manuscript. And you may be wondering, what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that right now. Matthew 6, 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, The Bible that I usually teach from is the ESV. I'm teaching from a different Bible from my study desk today, the New American Standard Bible, because of this right here. In the ESV, I have this portion, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then there's a little note. And I go down to the bottom of the page and it'll explain to me that there's another part of the verse in some manuscripts. In the NASB, I've got brackets in 613 that include for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. In the King James Bible, I think there are no brackets. I think it's included all as a part of the verse. And why is that? Why is there that difference in the way that this verse has? Well, The verse is not about this subject, but there is controversy around this verse that I want to address, and that subject is called the inerrancy of God's word. And so a question that we should ask is this, are there any errors in my Bible? You should not be afraid to ask that question. You should not be afraid to ask hard questions about the Bible. Are there any errors in the Bible? If you follow Jesus boldly, someone will probably say, your Bible has errors in it. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna follow Jesus boldly, that's probably a comment you're gonna get at some moment. Your Bible has errors in it. So how do you address that? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Anyone here ever said you were gonna do something and then you didn't do it? Raise your hand. Okay, anyone who doesn't have their hand raised is an incredibly silent person. <laughs> T- Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, silver tried in a for- furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Anybody here ever had an impure word come out of your mouth? Raise your hand. Some people didn't raise their hands. I'd really like to talk to your family. 
Psalm 119, 89, 96, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. I've seen a limit to all perfection. In other words, the things that are perfect that you can see, perfect on earth, perfect, okay, perfect on earth, there's a limit, but your commandment is exceedingly broad, so the perfection of the word of God is not bound. It expands, it's amazing, it's incredible, it's limitless. Every word of God is tested. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Proverbs 30, verse five. When things get crazy in our world, which they are, the safest place to be is hidden in God and in his word. Matthew 24, 25, heaven and earth will pass away. Hard to wrap my brain around that statement. Hard to understand that statement. That is a difficult statement to understand. Heaven and earth will pass away. I cannot even understand what that means. It is hard to wrap my brain around that. All I know is living on planet earth. To think that heaven and earth will pass away is kind of mind blowing. It says, but my words will not pass away. You don't want to make an investment that's going to last. You want to invest in a way that there will be a high return. Invest in the word of God. Because every other investment on planet earth, heaven and earth is going to pass away. But you know, an investment that is secure is when you invest the word of God into your life. My words will not pass away. John 17, 17, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus is praying for his disciples that their lives would become more pure, sanctified, made holy, ongoing process of being more and more like Jesus because of the truth of God. So the truth of God is what's gonna cleanse us. The truth of God is what's gonna help us to follow Jesus to be sanctified in the ongoing process, not salvation, but the ongoing process of sanctification being made more like Jesus. We're saved by the blood of Jesus, and then God continues to work in our life to transform our lives to be like him. Okay, here's the thing. We're gonna go to class for a second, okay? Stick with me here. We're gonna go to class, all right? Let's talk about this term inerrancy. What does it mean? The inerrancy of scripture means that scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. That's by Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology. Books that wide, that tall, that thick. I read it, I wrote the papers, I took the classes, I got the BS, BS from Moody Bible Institute trying to give you the cliff notes here, okay? Trying to give you the cliff notes here. Trying to help our church out. The inerrancy of scripture means that scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. There's an objection to this in our world, and this is the objection. We have no inerrant manuscripts, therefore talk about an inerrant Bible is misleading. That is an objection to the discussion of the inerrancy of God's word. That because we don't have in our possession inerrant manuscripts, therefore talk about an inerrant Bible is misleading. That may be That objection or a version of that objection may come your way when people want to accuse you of being somebody who follows a Bible that has errors in it. Okay, so let's address it. What is true about scripture manuscripts available to us? What is true about the scripture manuscripts that are available to us? I'm gonna share with you eight things. If it's too much to take in all at once, you can watch the recording again, okay? Number one, for over 99% of the words of the Bible, we know, that the original, we know what the original manuscript said because they all match up. So over 99% of the words of the Bible, we know what the original manuscript said because the, all the manuscripts match up. Number two, even for the many verses where there are textual variants, that's the phrase, textual variants is the phrase. That is, different words in different ancient copies of the same verse. The correct decision is often quite clear and there are really very few places where the textual variant is both difficult to evaluate and significant in determining the meaning. In other words, hasn't gotten difficult yet, hasn't gotten hard yet. Number three, in the small percentage of cases where there is significant uncertainty about what the original text said, the general sense of the sentence is usually quite clear from the context. 
One does not have to be a Hebrew or Greek scholar to know where these ver- te- textual variants are because all modern English transition, translations indicate them in the marginal notes with words such as some ancient manuscripts read or other ancient authorities add. And I explained to you in Matthew 6.13 in your own Bible, you probably have something like that in your own Bible about that. But context makes it clear. So still, there's not confusion. Number four, this is not to stay, say that the study of textual variance is unimportant, but it is to say that the study of textual variance has not left us in confusion about what the original manuscript said. It has re- rather brought us extremely close to the content of those original manuscripts. Number five, for most practical purposes then, the current published scholarly text of the Old Testament in Hebrew, Greek, New Testament, that's a fancy way for saying your Bible, are the same as the original manuscripts. Number six, thus when we say the original manuscripts were inerrant, we are also implying that over 99% of the words in our present manuscripts are also inerrant, for they are exact copies of the originals, because they all match up. Number seven, furthermore, we know where the uncertain readings are. I have pointed one out in Matthew 6, 13. For where there are no textual variants, we have no reason to expect faulty copying of the original. Why? Because they all match up. Number eight, thus, our present manuscripts, our Bible, what you're holding in your hand, are for most purposes the same as the original manuscripts and the doctrine of inerrancy therefore directly concerns our present manuscripts as well, which means what? It means you can trust your Bible. What does all of this mean? It means you can trust your Bible. I just gave you eight reasons. And if you want to study more, study more. There's a whole lot more in that chapter. But you can trust your Bible. When we pray, we're in a series about prayer. What does that matter for what? Well, when we pray, we can pray the truth of the word of God with 100% certainty. And that matters, which is why when I just spent time praying for Israel, I prayed from Psalm 83 because Psalm 83 addresses Israel and I know that I'm praying the correct thing if I pray scripture. I know that I can pray the right thing when I pray the word of God. And so when we pray, pray the word of God and you can know that you have 100% certainty that the word of God is true and it is reliable and it is trustworthy. And the enemy would love for you and others to think that the Bible is not trustworthy. But it is. It is God's word. And we can trust God in his word. So we have this text, Matthew 6, 13. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We just sang a song about it earlier. Can I trust this? It's in brackets. In in my Bible, it has a footnote. In my Bible, it's not even listed in the verse. Can I trust this verse? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Can I trust it? Yes, you can trust it because it's God's word. You can trust it. And when you have questions about God's word and you're not sure what you read on a page, turn the page. The best commentary for the word of the truth of God's word is the truth of God's word. So the best way to learn more about your Bible is to turn the page and read more of it. Let me show you an example. How is it that I am confident that this verse, go back, go back, there it is. How is, um, how is it that I'm so confident for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, is a true statement. And it's part of the truth of the word of God. First Chronicles 29 10 through 13 says this. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on earth, yours is the dominion, area of oversight, like a kingdom. O Lord, And you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might. And it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. Or in other words, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
God's word is clear. You can trust God's word. You can trust God's word. You can trust to pray God's word. When you're trying to learn how to pray, pray God's word. There are so many prayers in God's word. You can pray those prayers to learn how to pray. You can pray all of God's word. You can pray all of God's word into your own life. You can pray all of God's word into the lives of those you love. Learn to love the Lord. Learn to love Jesus by praying his word. It will draw you in to his heart. And you'll know that as you pray God's word, you are praying the right stuff. How can I pray the way God wants me to pray? Pray his word. That's the whole point of the entire series that we've been doing. Lord, teach us to pray. So we have this verse, Matthew 6, 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Can I trust this passage? Yes, you can trust this passage. Last week I taught on do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil Right now, I'm gonna make a couple brief comments now. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. I felt it was important that we addressed what's happening in the nation of Israel, so I spent time doing that, and I felt it was important that we address the issue of inerrancy to give us confidence now that we're gonna teach on a verse that has brackets on it in my Bible, make sure that we're not brushing over that, but embracing that as a church family, to be confident in our Bible, confident in the word of God. And so I'll just share a few Shorter comments here about this verse. The verse is relatively clear. Everything belongs to God. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. What can we learn from this? Jesus closes our pattern for prayer with four truths. Four truths out of that little statement there. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Four truths. The first is, for yours is the kingdom. For yours is the kingdom. What is the truth we draw from this? We pray, when we pray, we pray with 100% certainty that the kingdom belongs to God. There is no confusion when we pray. Who's in charge? Who's the king? Who's over the kingdom? When you pray about whatever it is you're praying about in your life, whatever the thing is you're praying about in your life, we pray with 100% certainty the kingdom belongs to God, which means no matter how bad it gets on Coffee Road or in the Middle East, the kingdom belongs to God, and I can be confident that the kingdom belongs to God. And so I'll pray with certainty that the kingdom belongs to God. Earlier in the Lord's Prayer, verses 9 and 10 out of Matthew 6, pray that in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We spent weeks teaching through that. I would encourage you to go back and listen to those messages if you'd like more about that. Ephesians 2.10, for his, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, which means when we're confidently praying that the kingdom belongs to God and we recognize we're a citizen of the kingdom and God has prepared us to do some things on his behalf that gives us confidence to move forward in the work that God has for us because we have confidence He's the king, and the kingdom belongs to him. And so it gives us confidence to follow our king and to do the things that he is asking us to do to honor him. The passage goes on, for yours is the power. For yours is the power. So the second truth we can pull from this is when we pray, we pray with 100% certainty that the power belongs to God. When we pray, no matter what we're praying about, we can have certainty that the power belongs to God. God is powerful enough regarding whatever it is we're praying about. The power belongs to him. Jesus in Matthew 28, as he is giving his disciples instruction, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus is claiming all authority. We pray, understanding, with 100% certainty that the power belongs to God and Jesus is saying, all of the authority has been given to me. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, as he is explaining to his disciples what's about to happen, they're about to be, they're about to receive an incredible power surge. And the way he describes it in Acts 1, eight, is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the remotest parts of the earth. So Jesus, is, who has all authority, is saying, I am going to give you power, and the way you're going to receive that power is through the power, it's going to be through the Holy Spirit of God. And that power source is going to cause you to live as my witness. Which is why in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes and he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What is he saying? He's saying, we didn't get in a room with a whiteboard and start like bullet pointing stuff and going, hey, how can we you know, weave this cleverly devised tale? Like, let's tell a story. Let's tell a really big story. And let's figure out how episode one is gonna tie into episode two, which is gonna tie into episode three. And season one is gonna connect to season two. He's not, we didn't do any of that. We experienced the power of God. And the power of God has changed our lives. All we're doing is responding to the power of God as it has changed our lives. So when we pray, we pray with 100% certainty that the power belongs to God. Jesus has all authority. He says we're gonna have power when the Holy Spirit comes on us. And when we minister, when we go do the things, because we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, when we go do the things that God's called us to do, it's not in our own power. It's in his power. And we trust his power. We don't trust in my stuff. I trust in God's stuff. I don't trust in my power, my ability. I've got to trust in God's power, what he is going to accomplish. And the same is for all of us. A passage goes on, for yours is the glory. For yours is the glory. So what's the truth that we pull here? Truth number three. We pray with 100% certainty the glory belongs to God. When we pray, we pray with 100% certainty that the glory belongs to God. What does that mean? It means it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about my preferences. It's not about what I prefer. It's not about my opinion. It's not about what I like and dislike. It's not about what makes me feel good and what makes me feel bad. It's not about me. This is not about me. It is about God. And when we pray, we can pray that 100% certainty that the glory belongs to God and not me. Which is why every day I have to make a choice. Is today a day I'm going to worship Joel or I'm going to worship Jesus? That's why Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? You've got to take up your cross daily and follow me. You've got to die to yourself. You've got to die. Crucify the flesh. Does not feel good. Stinks. It's horrible. Yeah, death doesn't feel good. Crucify the flesh. It's not about me. And the more I can learn it's not about me, the, the better my life's gonna be with Jesus. Maybe that'll apply to you. Maybe you can take some encouragement from that. It's not about me, it's about him. Jesus said in John 15, eight, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. It's about our lives bearing fruit because of him, not because of me. God's glorified when God displays his own work in my life, not when I do great stuff for Jesus. When God does great stuff for his own glory and there's fruit in my life, God's glorified. And then it ends with forever, amen. What does forever amen mean? Forever amen means it's gonna last ongoing and we all agree. That's what forever amen means. It means it's, it's, it's just gonna keep happening this way and we're all gonna agree, forever amen. So truth number four, we pray with 100% certainty it'll never change. When we pray, we pray with 100% certainty that the kingdom, the power, and the glory belong to God and it's never going to change. The kingdom is never gonna to belong to you. It's always gonna to belong to God. The power is never gonna to belong to you. It's always gonna to belong to God. The glory is never gonna to belong to you. It's always gonna to belong to God, and it's never gonna change. Does God invite us to be able to be participants of his great, amazing plan? Yeah, it's the best plan to be a part of. It's not about me, though. It's about him. It's about him. And it's probably a reason when Jesus closes this prayer that he has our focus go this way. He goes, stop thinking about ourselves 
and think about the Lord. Let's stand together. You've been very, very patient today. Our church is full of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit of patience. Thank you. Thank you. And so we have this prayer, and we'll close with this prayer. Jesus says, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And all God's family said.